we are in a series called This We Believe, and, and we're walking through some of the foundational things that we believe as followers of Christ. And so some of this here may be fresh to you, but most of it would be the basics. And, you know, I find, like, in a house, if you skip the basics, like the foundation, when the storms come and the flood rises, it kind of washes that uh, house away, doesn't it? And so often it's easy to neglect the basics of our faith and or just assume we got it, but not really know why we got it and not really uh, internalize it so it gets up here in the head but it doesn't get into the heart and then into the hands. And Christianity has to go uh, beyond the head, and it has to go beyond the heart as well, into the hands. So as we're talking about this, this we believe, we're primarily talking about the things that we believe, but what we believe leads to who we become, right? So the kind of person you are is based on what you believe, and the kind of person you are will determine the things that you do. So we have beliefs, we have values or character, and then we have actions. And so you've got to make sure that your, your beliefs are solid and found on the Word of God if you are a follower of Christ. Because if your beliefs are somewhere else out here, then what's going to happen is you might have some that line up with, and you, know, you have the character of Christ and the, the uh, actions that line up, but you'll have other things where there's just this conflict. And you have to get to not just the, act, uh, the behavior. We're not trying to change behavior. we got to get to, okay, but who are you? But we got to get deeper than that. What, what do you really believe about this? And so this is why we're walking through some of these really simple truths from the Scripture. And today we're going to look at uh, stewardship. Stewardship. So on Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2, I want to put this sc- Scripture up on the screen. And I'd like for us all to read it out loud and loudly together. Psalm 24, verse 1 and 2. 1, 2, 3, up on the screen. I, you know, I was trying practicing for my magic show, and um, I find that I need to stick to a different line of work than that. Okay, I'm going to read it to you. You brought your Bibles anyways, but here we go. Psalm chapter 24, verse 1 and 2. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. What belongs to the Lord? Everything. Who does it belong to? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. All who live in it. He founded it on the seas. Okay, so when you think of the word stewardship, if you ever think of the word stewardship, but when you hear the word stewardship in church, what do you think of? I mean, some people start thinking, where's my wallet? Did that preacher come by and grab my wallet again? You know, like, what's he going to say? What's he going to do? Is it safe here? Sometimes people think about giving. They think about maybe even tithing, maybe, maybe giving the, the 10, 10%, bringing their tithe to the Lord. Or, uh, but the biblical concept, the biblical understanding of stewardship is more than just finances and giving and portions. But it really is, uh, it's bigger than that, okay? So it leads to this question, what, how much of me does God want? How much does God want of me? What do you think? You know, God does want all of you. And some of us might even think, why would he want all of me? There's parts of me that I don't even want, right? Why would God want that part? <laughs> but yet God wants all of you. He wants your gifts, your strengths, your talents, your hopes, your dreams, the good, the bad, the ugly. He wants all of that. And, you know, he chose you in the midst of it, right? He didn't look at you and say, ah, you know, I'll take you, but not with those things. So clean all that up first and then come see me, right? That's not, that's not, uh, that's not how God does it. It's not like we give a resume to him and he's like, get this stuff in order and then uh, maybe I'll, I'll bring you into my family. He actually brings us into his family prior to that. Like, like. Hey, I'll take you just as you are. But I love you too much to leave you that way. But I will take you just as you are. How many of you would say God is working on the person next to me? Like, it's clear. And he's not done yet, right? Okay, that's so true. Uh, So stewardship here, God wants all of you. Stewardship, when we talk about stewardship, stewardship does not begin with what you have, but it begins with what has you. Or we could even say who has you. So when we talk about the belief of stewardship, We are talking about who 
has you? What has you? So it's not about what you are stewarding. That's not where you start with it. It goes to that, but it begins with, but who has you? Who has you? That we get at a much deeper level. So if God has all of you, then all you have is his, right? If he has all of me, then everything that I have is his, because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So sometimes when we do things, uh, we practice things as Christians, we don't always understand why we do it. So then we, we pick and choose what we want to do or not do because of our beliefs, right? And so when we recognize, oh, everything I am and everything I have, it comes from God. It belongs to the Lord. Lord, you can use it however. You can use me however. When we learn to trust God and we know that he has the best intention for us, that he's trustworthy, then when he asks us or challenges us to do certain things, to not do certain things, to think a certain way, to not think a certain way, uh, to, to speak a certain way, to not speak a certain way, to treat someone a certain way or not treat them a certain way, when we trust that God knows better, when we trust that God is for us, then suddenly we can trust, okay, even if I don't see it that way, agree with that, but yet I trust you, so I'm going to surrender to you. I'm going to follow you. Stewardship, that's, that's where that willingness to act that way, to act on it, to follow, that's where it comes from is I'm a steward. My time, my treasure, my talents, my character, my, my words, my actions, all of that is something that I am managing that does not belong to me any longer. It belongs to him. So what do you want me to do with it? That's this belief of stewardship. So what does it mean if God has all of me and all I have is his? What does that mean for us? It means that you don't have to stress over how much resources that you have. It, do, it means you don't have to stress or worry about how to spend or, or what to save or, or how to invest or, or how to give it, how, how, to, how to use it. It means that you have peace and freedom because it's not yours. Now, we have a responsibility, just like if you manage, uh, you're a manager for a company and say the, the boss, he owns it all, but you manage those resources and you manage them in a way that will benefit the boss and it serves the purposes of the business. Typically, we're taking good care of the customers. We're taking good care of the employees, right? We're taking being uh, good in our community. You manage things in that way, but you're not the one that has to carry the stress of it all. You're not the one that has to not sleep at night based on the challenges. That's the boss's job. That's the owner's job. You clock out. Now, I know some are like, not at my job. I know, but let's just go with this story, okay? Let's just go with this. Imagine, this is my story I'm telling you. You get it. But that's the idea, like, oh, man, sorry, sorry, boss. It looks like, you know, these things didn't work out or that person's disgruntled or, you know, we need more resources over here or some of these things look like they're being delayed. What do you want me to do? I'm a manager of your resources. I'll do whatever you say, and, and I'll use what, what I bring to the table the, to the best of my ability. And as all benevolent bosses are, they're like, well, let me help you out. You're doing such a good job. Thanks for asking. You know, no, your job's not at, at threat here, threatened at all. Um, <laughs> you know, that, okay, so every good analogy breaks down somewhere. But you get it. There's resources that God has placed in our hands but they belong to him. So, Lord, what do you want us to do with it? How do you want us to carry this or, or manage this? Now, this is important to understand the belief of stewardship, that we are stewards, because the only way that biblical teachings on finances, resources, giving and investing and increase even can truly be understood and make sense and really acted on, it's through the lenses of stewardship. So if we, if we just talk about giving or using our time or resources or serving and we just look at that, it's kind of, um, it's, it's kind of like, yeah, you pick and choose. But when you understand you're a steward and then you read these other verses, 
suddenly they make sense. And, and it's not a, we don't have to resist. We don't have to put up a fight or anything along those lines. We can actually say, oh, I understand that now because of who I am and what I believe about stewardship, that God has made me a steward. Now, again, a s- steward, it's not a word that we all use, but it's sort of another word could be like a manager. But if you think of it like this, maybe you owned a business and your business is struggling. Maybe you have a lot of debt and things just aren't working out and you're under a lot of stress. You got this small business, but it has potential. But nevertheless, uh, it might crash and burn any time. And then a larger corporation, a larger company comes in and says, you know what? We actually like you. We actually like w- your potential and what you do. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to buy you out. We're going to take on all your debt, right? We're, we're going to take that upon ourselves. We're going to invest in you. We're going to give you access to our resources. Uh, we're going to hire you, hire your team. on. You're going to work for us. So, so you will belong to us. Your company will belong to us. We will own it now, and you will be the manager of it. We're hiring you to, to manage that. It, when companies do that and, and they, they buy these smaller companies, uh, that boss, if he g- continues on, he becomes a steward of that company, that department, that division. Well, that's kind of how it worked out in our life, that we, uh, we had a lot of potential, <laughs> but there's a lot of debt. There's some ups and downs of our life, that all the, the strengths, all the dysfunction. And Christ came on the cross and he said, I am willing to buy you out, but I'm not going to buy you out and eliminate you. Actually, I'm going to take on all your debt. I'm, I'm going to take on, you know, take you on with all your inadequacies, all your limitations, but also all your strengths, all your experience, all your insight, uh, everything, your gifts, your talents. I'm going to take all of that here and I'm going to take it on myself. I will. I am going to. Well, as the Bible says, you are not your own. You are bought with a price. The precious blood of Jesus is how valuable your company called life was. It's not, there's not enough money. There's not enough silver or gold to place value on you. There's, it's more than that. It's the precious blood of Jesus. That's how valuable you were to God. Which, by the way, just anybody come from a background where you're like in church, you were just, uh, you were terrible. Like, you know, like there's no value in people and God hates you all. But you're very fortunate to be here today. Anybody come from a background like that? Yeah, <laughs> some hands out there. You're not in that church, by the way. <laughs> you're like, yeah, this one. No, not this one. We don't believe that. Now, we, we sin has separated us from God. Uh, but I'm telling you, what would you give your life for? Would you give your life for something you hate? Would you give your life for someone you want nothing to do with? No, you love and cherish. That, that would be required typically before you give your life for someone. And, and God looked at us where his, where, where his, his, um, his joy and his inheritance said, I'm, I, I want them. They're so valuable to me that I'll give my own life. So he buys out your company called Life. And, uh, and he doesn't eliminate you. He still gives you stewardship over it, management over it. So you still have responsibility for all of it, but it's no longer yours. You're not only accountable to yourself. You're accountable to him. You're accountable for all you are and all you do and all you become to him. And the good thing is, is that he is on your side. And so it's not an accountability like "Eh, you're going to give an account one day, buddy. Like, I just, oh, I just can't wait to bring that up in heaven. You know, God is, that's not the kind of accountability that he's looking forward to. And hopefully that stuff's not, it's not going to happen that way for us because we know God's actually, oh, here I am to help you. Here I am to address that. Here I am to strengthen you. I know what to do over there. Oh, there's lack. I know how to provide. I've got provision for you. Oh, you need, you need some connections. I've got the connections. Oh, you need, you need spiritual help over there. I've got spirit. You need physical help. I've got that for you. He is resourcing you. He's benevolent. He's generous. He's on your side. You know, think about any business. They want their business to succeed. I, I don't know why any companies have this culture to where they tear down their team. Like, why would you ever do that? These are the ones who are producing for your business. You should do everything you can to make it awesome for them. You want them to succeed because when they succeed, man, your business flourishes. Your business grows and expands and you accomplish your mission. And God is the same way. He's not that mean God. 
He is the God who's sitting there saying, oh, oh, yep, look at you. Oh, you messed that up. Well, that was a learning lesson. That's okay. I got enough to cover for that. It's called grace. Oh, there's mercy over here. He's on our side. He's on our side because we're stewards. He already bought us. He paid the price for us. We belong to him. And so he's our help in time of need. So that's kind of like, you know, how we get we understand stewardship is that he is the owner. We are the manager of our lives. Tell somebody next to you, say you're not in charge. Some of you have been wanting to say that. Some of you have been saying that for a while anyways and had nothing to do with this message. You're not in charge of me. The person next to you might be in charge of you. Okay, let's just be honest. <laughs> but they are not in charge of them. Ultimately. Okay, so again, it is by understanding that we are stewards of God's resources that we can believe and act upon verses like these. Now let's read some of these scriptures. And I want you to look for the partnership. Because as a steward, he's saying, hey, do this and this is what I'll do. And if, if we can catch this from the perspective of the lens of stewardship, that I am just managing his resources, then I understand, oh, these are actually, these are my SOPs for, for work. These are my SOPs for life. So here's some of them that we understand better through the light of stewardship. Uh, Malachi 3.10, you've heard this. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. See the partnership? See God giving instruction and him also saying, and this is what I will do. Are we up there on the screen? Thank you. You can see that there. Luke 638. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. I always think that's a funny verse. How many, body, I think it's the King James that says poured into your bosom. Yeah, poured into your bosom. Man, how many of you want blessing poured into your bosom? Man, maybe that's why some people have been stingy. They're like, I don't want any blessing in my bosom. Stay off my bosom, right? <laughs> Not this generation. Okay, given will be given to you. Good measure, press down. This is when you get ice cream. And you go, you don't want that scrawny little kid scooping your ice cream. You want Bubba to get in there and scoop that ice cream. And then when it comes to packing that in the bowl, you want it pressed down, smashed in there. You want it to fill up every little space. I don't know if you can really shake it together with the ice cream, but you get the idea that you want it to be uh, full, running over, dripping down your chin <laughs> onto your bosom, into your lap there, right? He said, it'll be poured into your bosom. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Okay, so if I understand stewardship, I understand, oh, he's giving me instruction on what to do with his stuff. He says, do this, and the measure I, I, I give his stuff away or to whatever he's telling me to do, it will be measured back to me. So this is what he's saying, well, this is how it works. Because I'm a steward. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. Remember this, whoever sp sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. You see, there's a connection. For e each of you should give what you have decided to, in your heart to give. So then he goes to the heart of the thing. So... You're going to give a lot, you're going to give a little, you're going to give sparingly, you're going to give generously, whatever you do. But do what you do, you've decided in your heart to do, not reluctantly or under compulsion. How do you know if you're giving reluctantly or under compulsion? This is how you know. The offering plate comes by, you give, and then you watch the offering plate the whole way. There it goes. <laughs> Never going to see that again. <laughs> somebody, somebody comes and asks you for some help with something, you're like, uh, okay. Like, I, if, if I have it on my calendar, oh, crap, I don't have anything else on my calendar. I guess I have to help you. That's re reluctantly. I feel com 
compulsion. My wife volunteers me all the time for things like, hey, can you get this thing done? Compulsion. But I have read this verse, babe, and I do it out of a cheerful heart now. Is that good? It doesn't count when I already said it like that. All right, all right. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God loves us when we just give cheerfully. Why, why can I give cheerfully? Have you ever given away something that is somebody else's? And you're like, here. <laughs> Some of you, you're clearing out the, you know, your, your, your family member's closet, your husband wife's closet, or kid's stuff, and you're like, hey, here's all their stuff that's been at my house forever. You can have it. You know, it's fun to give away other people's stuff. And I think that this idea of I am a steward, everything that I have, it actually belongs to God. It changes my attitude in giving because I'm, it's exciting. I'm giving you God's stuff. I'm giving you God's stuff. And I know that God loves the cheerful giver, and the verse isn't done yet because it says this, and God is able to bless you abundantly. Everybody say you. He's able to bless you abundantly so that at, at, in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Look at this connection. When you understand stewardship, this isn't just a verse about, hey, let's give today, let's use this in our tithe and offering statement, or anything like this. This is our lifestyle of, wow, I am a steward. And when I give, and I give cheerfully, then I know this. God is able at all times, in every situation, to, get, to provide everything that I need to bless me with that. So I can do what he's called me to do. And so if I have this in my hand, clearly God has given me the ability to do it. And so I'll do it. And, and guess what? You're a, you have open hands, and as you freely receive, you freely give. As a steward, you understand that. As a manager, you get that. As an owner, mm-mm, mm-mm. If you don't, you don't get, catch those things that when you are the owner, because then suddenly you know there's this economy thing going on, this talk of recession, we got the inflation, we got these things happening. I've got all this stuff that I need to be worried about because it's my stuff, and I'm responsible for my stuff. And when, when we understand, oh, actually God's responsible for my whole life, my whole life, then I just, I'm seeking, okay, what do you say, God? So here's the key idea. Here's the key idea. You guys ready for this? This one's going on the screen, right? Key idea. I believe everything I am and everything I own belong to God. Let's say that out loud. That's, that's actually a key idea, not key question. I believe, say this out loud. I believe everything I am and everything I own belong to God. So this is, this is what we're, we're getting at. When we say this we believe, we believe that everything we are and everything we own belongs to the Lord. Everything that we own. If you believe that you are the owner and not steward of your life, then you will argue, you will nitpick, you will resist, you'll find every reason that these verses and others don't apply to you. You ever have conversation with somebody about uh, Scripture and things especially that have to do with God's provision in their life and with them acting on it, whether it's his direction for investing or saving or spending or giving and and they want to argue or say, well, you know, and ah, but then the law and the Old Testament and the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic. And then there's this one text found in the Dead Sea and, you know, everything. There's all this resistance. It's because you are not looking at it through the lens of being a steward. You're looking at it through the lens of I am in charge of my own life. I am an owner and I get to say what what it means. I get to say what I apply. I get to say what I do with it all because I am the owner. And I have not yet yielded or surrendered that area of my life or maybe my whole life and, and seen myself as a steward. And so we, this is where these are foundational beliefs for us. That no, when he said that I'm to lay down my life and follow him, he meant it. And he is going to take full care of me along the way. But if I choose to save my life, I'm going to end up losing it. And so I'm going to actually take him up on his offer. I want to be, I want him to be the owner. So here's the question. 
How do I move from owner to manager of my life? In Romans 12, 1, probably familiar with this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies, by, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your true and proper worship. So how do you actually become this? You offer yourself as a living sacrifice. Now, it's interesting because typically when you sacrifice something, you're killing it, right? Like I'm gonna sa- but he's saying a living sacrifice. And you've heard this probably because it's a preacher joke, which are closely related to dad jokes. And it's like, you know, the problem with a living sacrifice, it keeps crawling off the altar, right? Haha. <laughs> and that is the kind of response that I get out of most of my dad jokes. Nevertheless, once I have to explain it, then it's, that's the funny part. Like, there he goes again. Uh, but the reality is this, a living sacrifice. How, how do you become a living sacrifice? Well, y- you live your life at the altar. You're continuously at the altar. You're continuously bringing yourself before the Lord. Your thoughts, your ideas, your opinions, your hopes, your dreams, your questions, You're continuously bringing that before God and say, God, this belongs to you. What do you want me to do with it? My schedule belongs to you. My heart belongs to you. My attitude belongs to you. My beliefs belong to you. My my theology belongs to you. My skills, my abilities, they belong to you. My family belongs to you. Lord God, everything that's in the realm of what I would say is mine, it's actually yours. And so what do you say about it? What do you want to do with it? I'm a steward. I'm a living steward sacrifice, and I'm continuously presenting myself before the Lord. I'm reminding myself, you remind yourself that he is the Lord, and you are not. Remind yourself of that, that freely you've received, freely you shall give. You ask God to show you through his word, by the way, this is so important, ask God to show you through his word what you should do. What, what, what should you do? What direction should you go? What should you act on? How, how do you live? How do you live this life he's given you? I'm a steward, God. This is what we do. We continuously stay at the altar. We present ourselves there. We don't stand back and justify and sit there and say, well, you know, the way I see it is, or, you know, all these other people say, or this or that. No, I'm yielding my heart to him to his word, to who he is, to his character, to his will, and saying, God, I belong to you. I belong to you. I'm not in charge of my own life. And, and you know what it is? It's so much more freeing. It's so much more liberating. It's so much more peaceful. There's so much more rest. There's so much less stress and anxiety when it's, oh, I'm not in charge. I'm not, I, I'm not God. <laughs> of my, I'm not on the throne. So I have the responsibility to serve him, but I'm not, as I do that, I'm not responsible to do God's job in my life. And when you do that, God suddenly starts to trust you. It seems like, oh, look at that. You trust me? Well, here, you've been faithful with a little. I'll make you faithful over much more. He has no problem doing that. Why is that? Because you recognize you're a steward of his, his stuff. And you are his stuff. You are his stuff. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take just a moment to pray. And then some of you are, are, are newer here, so you think, okay, this is kind of interesting. Tables, that's convenient. Is that stuff around? Actually, one of the reasons why we do this is because uh, in church, it's so easy to hear a message and then go out and never actually internalize it, talk about it, or talk, think about how does this apply to our lives? And so... Oh, about six months ago, actually earlier this year, we shifted to where we we connect around these tables or we turn our chairs around. And at the end of every service, we just throw a couple uh, questions on the screen so that we can talk about what is it that we're hearing? How do we how do we apply this to our life? What is it speaking? What's you know, what are we getting getting out of this? Because I have found that it's easy to hear a message and it stops at that. But Jesus said, come here and do. So we've got to talk about it. Well, well give some response to it, interact around it, and then think about, well, what will I do about that? How will I apply that? How can I apply it in my life? What about this question? That's, 
how, you know, you start to interact around the words. So if you're newer here, and, and uh, I just want you to feel comfortable, we don't expect anybody to answer every question or any question. You're welcome just to sit and listen. And if you're at a table and you're hosting a table, just encourage people. Um, make sure they all feel welcome, and anybody can jump in. And nobody needs to spend time doing all the talking either. For those of you who do all the talking, I'm not looking at anyone, but uh, make sure everyone feels welcome. So let's pray, and then we're going to take about 10 minutes just to talk. And then I'll, I'll wrap us up, and we got some uh, food at the end, because we always like to eat every day, but here at church. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. God, help each and every one of us to respond um, to the invitation to belong to you. Thank you for your blood that was shed on the cross to purchase us, that we would belong to you. Lord God, and it's a good thing. It's life-giving. You've resurrected us with Christ. We've been raised from the dead. Thank you for that, for new life. God, anyone who of us, and, and it's even me, that at times we struggle with ownership versus management. Lord, I repent. Lord God, w would you even say if you've struggled with that, people just say, Lord, forgive me for trying to take ownership of my life. I give you full control. I give you full ownership. I want to manage it well, follow you well, but I believe that all I am and all I have belongs to you. In your precious name, Jesus, amen. Okay, so let's just take a couple minutes. You can turn some chairs around. Invite someone to sit at your table. If, there's, if they see anybody by themselves, make sure everyone feels very welcome. And uh, I'm going to come back in 10 minutes. Let's talk. Sounds like you guys are having some good conversation. I want to encourage you to keep it going. Uh, but if you would like to grab something to eat, we have egg rolls. I rolled them up myself. I cracked every egg, put them in there, chickens, put the chickens and the eggs together. Actually, Brianne did that. Feel free to grab something. We love you guys. Uh, we'll be back with you next week. I hope you have a wonderful week. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>